This program is paid for by Your Radio Doctor, LLC. All opinions or statements expressed on this program are solely those of Your Radio Doctor and their guests and do not reflect the opinions of WPHT or Odyssey. Your Radio Doctor does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, products, physicians, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on Your Radio Doctor. Always consult your own physician. Today's program has been pre-recorded. I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars. Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. Talk Radio 1210. WPHT, WPHT, HD, WOGL, HD3, Philadelphia. From the Cherry Hill Volvo Studios, where relationships matter. It's time for the Delaware Valley's first radio doctor on call every Saturday afternoon at 5. This is your radio doctor with Dr. Marianne Ritchie, presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. Listen, seven months or 10 months is an absolutely exceptional, exceptionally short time frame to produce this vaccine. Your health determines your life, your longevity, and your happiness. Let your radio doctor lead the way with your medical education. Your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Good evening and welcome to your radio doctor. I'm your host, Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Our topic this evening, concussions. Every time an athlete walks onto the field, steps onto the ice, dives into a pool, a head injury is a possible risk. So every coach, school nurse, athletic trainer should be up to date with information regarding diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation of concussions. We associate concussions with heavy hitting sports like football, lacrosse, but they can occur during any physical activity. Even a simple trip and fall can result in head injury, motor vehicle accidents. I'm very pleased to welcome our special guest, who will bring the most current information about recognizing, treating, and preventing concussions. Dr. Christine Grease, an associate professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation from the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and Hackensack Meridian Health School of Medicine. She's also the director of the concussion program and an attending on the Brain Injury and Stroke Rehabilitation Service at Hackinson Meridian Health and JFK Johnson Rehabilitation Institute. Welcome, Christine. So good of you to join us. Thank you so much, Marianne, for having me, and I really appreciate this opportunity. So we should probably begin with the definition of concussion. I think that's confusing to people. Well, uh, it's very important to note um, that concussion is a type of brain injury. There's a lot of uh, you know information out there that says concussion is separate from a brain injury. It is a subtype. Uh, we call it uh, AKA mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and it's pretty much something where it's caused by a blow, a bump, um, a jolt to the head or the body um, that can cause the brain and the head to move rapidly back and forth. So the brain oscillates back and forth inside the inner walls of the skull. So that sudden movement and that oscillation, almost like a pendulum stock, um, it bounces around or twists in the skull, creating chemical changes, creating lots of swelling in a very cl- in a closed shell container, which is the skull, um, and can sometimes also stretch or damage brain cells. Um, so what does that mean? It means that everything that's happening inside the head can cause manifestations clinically or on the outward appearance for a person to have any type of dysfunction or the inability for their central processing system, which we know is the nervous system, to not function properly. Um, and so th- that is really the, you know, the ultimate definition of a concussion. Of course, I would expect it from you, but that was the best explanation and best mental image that you painted for our listeners. Because I, th- I really think most people think a, a knock to the head or a fall and a, a person hits their head on the ground. But you made a very important point. If you're hit in the body and or if you fall on your seat, if you fall on your bottom, it can uh, cause a, um, I guess, a, a force or your, your brain can be, not to be disrespectful, but rolling around in that closed space. 
and it causes a chemical change, which we'll talk about later. In other words, if you're the patient's taken to the emergency room and the cat skin is negative, it doesn't mean there hasn't been a soft spot on that tomato. That's just happened, right? There's something that's, Absolutely. or is it, or is it not a soft spot? As you say, it's chemical. Is it all through the brain? What's the, what's the mechanism of injury, I guess? Well, generally speaking, uh, it can happen at any point in time, any, in any way. So for instance, it could be where uh, there is an acceleration type of injury. An acceleration mechanism means that the individual themselves are running towards a stagnant object, um, mm. you know, such as hitting the head to the wall or falling on a flat and a concrete surface um, oh. or falling. But it's really the actual acceleration injury versus the deceleration injuries where uh, there are actually forces transmitted to a stationary head. So the actual person is stationary, but the forces that are coming at them uh, versus rotational injuries. Um, and they could be a combination where uh, the head is jolted back and forth very quickly or the neck is turned very rapidly during such as a blow to the to the head during a boxing match, mm. um, you know, or a punching match or any any sort of those. So those are rotational injuries where the brain just twists um, back and forth on a stagnant, um, you know, piece of tissue, which is what we know as the brain stalk and the midbrain and the hindbrain. Um, and then there's a lot more twisting motion. Um, and so, and there could be a combination of all three, which we see frequently in um, motor vehicle accidents, high speed uh, type of injuries, and also blast injuries, where the fact mm. that there is, let's say, uh, in, in, in our veterans who serve, uh, you know, overseas, and they're exposed to all of these ex blast uh, type of mechanisms and force vectors, they could be standing maybe a mile or two away from the blast, but the forces that are tra traveling in the air are enough to cause a rattling of the brain itself inside the skull. And that rattling in return causes lots and lots of damage and disruption to all those great chemical signals that happen in the brain and also some swelling as a result of those damage in the, the chemical system uh, signals. And that swelling then causes these concussive symptoms. So they mm. didn't even have to hit their head for those force vectors to travel through their body, through their brain tissue, and have concussive symptoms. Um, so that is, it doesn't necessarily have to actually be an impact to the head, which is a common uh, misconception out there. Yes. And uh, loss of consciousness. You don't have to have a blackout uh, or, or lack of losing consciousness, lack of passing out, doesn't mean you haven't had a concussion. Am I right? Correct. Exactly. And so that was a big misconception where, uh, you know, people thought, oh, you know, in order to have a concussion, that loss of consciousness had to be part of the diagnosis. In fact, many, many years ago, some of the more common guidelines used to uh, report that. But and now we have really went away from that because we realize in the medical world that especially the neurological world, patients are experiencing c concussive symptoms uh, throughout without having loss of consciousness. And so there is no correlation um, mm -hmm. and, and there is no re requirement. So if a person's symptoms resolve and they feel better and they're examined, we'll talk about those steps later, but what is it about having one concussion that makes a person more vulnerable or it makes it easier if they hit their head again or they have some um, you know, situation where they, they're more likely to have a concussion again? The most important thing is lack of full recovery from the initial concussion. And so it is really more how it's separated by time. Uh, so concuss mm. concussive subsequent concussions, or what we call in sports, we see this a lot, subconcussive blows or AKA repetitive head injuries, where there is mm. a small little concussive injuries that happen throughout the game or throughout the time that can create an additive effect. An, in, an impact where there was not enough time for some of the initial swelling to resolve and then subsequently there becomes another hit, that can cause more detrimental effects than if the person were to experience even one big massive blow to the head but have that time to recover. Gotcha. So what are the common risk factors that, that, we, that are 
that are out there. Sports, we should talk about that, I guess. Well, yes. I mean, so, okay. People have been hitting their heads since the beginning of time. Since we've learned to walk on this earth, we've been hitting our heads. Uh, it, it just kind of comes with life, right? I mean, even as a kid. So when it comes to risk factors, let's just start from, you know, the beginning, uh, you know, children's age group, uh, you know, their, their risk factors are that they have very small necks and they have big heads um, and they're small bodies. And on top of it, they're learning how to walk. Uh, and so in the children's uh, time, just being a child puts you at risk for a brain injury. Um, sure. and, and we've all, you know, those who have had kids totally get it, right? Those who have toddlers who are learning how to walk and mobilize, what are they? They are a fall risk. And so what we see is there is a classic distribution, a bimodal distribution of the really young and the really old that have these risk factors because they have a risk of falling. And as we know, falls are the most common causes of all brain injury is falling uh, more than any other uh, causes. So the other risk factor besides having either the age group, so the really, really young, under age five, and the really, really old, which is usually over 75, 80, um, those are the ones that are also at a fall risk and, and age, age can be an, an issue. Moving on to a little bit of an older period when they start playing sports. So, you know, now the child learning how to walk. They're really good. They can alternate steps well. They have great balance. They can hop on one foot. But they also continue and, uh, you know, move on to the, uh, that, that piece of the sport. Sports is a big one. Then they move to the teenage years, and then they have, obviously, they're involved in driving. They're not coordinated well. So motor vehicle accidents, very common in the teens, 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, in that age group. And then we go again to uh, all other causes um, of brain injuries, such as uh, attacks, all violence, uh, all different types of those things, and then blast injuries in those who serve. And then again, we go down to the, uh, you know, in the later age group where there's a lot more common is, is the fall. So the risk factors, having a very small neck, having weak shoulders, having weak musculature, having poor balance, poor vision, uh, poor coordination. It's pretty much anything that will prevent the person from breaking the fall is a risk factor. Um, and so that's that's kind of like this whole, uh, that, that distribution um, of you know, symptoms. Christine, you bring up such important features that a lot of people don't consider. Let's take a little break and we'll be right back with Dr. Christine Grease. Thanks for listening to Your Radio Doctor with Dr. Marianne Ritchie, exclusively presented by Independence Blue Cross. If you have a question for the medical mailbag, just send a note to doctor at yourradiodoctor.net. Hi, I'm Dr. Denny Caris, Chief Science Officer at Recovery Centers of America, and I'm here as your addiction expert. I get asked a lot by family members. You know, my loved one had a problem with cocaine or heroin. Why can't they have wine with dinner with me? Because I like to drink wine and it wasn't my problem, right? Well, I think about it like this. There's a genetic component to addiction overall, and there's lots of different genes. But if you've got it, you're going to have a predisposition towards addiction to many different things. But the reality is that somebody who had a problem with one drug is very likely to develop a problem with another drug or with alcohol. Look at it like that carnival game on the boardwalks, whack-a-mole, where the, they come up and you hit it down and another one pops up and you hit that one down. That's kind of what this is like. You don't want to have all the different addictions coming up while you're whacking one down at a time. That's why people that have a problem with one drug really have to quit all mind-altering substances. So do yourself a favor, know that they've got to quit all the different mind-altering substances, and maybe if you don't really need that wine with dinner, you can support them by not having it. After all, they're doing their best to maintain their recovery. If you or a loved one has a problem with alcohol or drugs, call 1-888-RECOVERY today or go to recoverycentersofamerica.com. We answer the phone and admit patients 24-7. That number again is 1-888-RECOVERY. I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars, Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. 
excruciating pain brought on by your son, daughter, or spouse suffering from addiction, you are not alone. If you call Recovery Centers of America today at 1-888-RECOVERY, your whole family can begin to recover. At Recovery Centers of America at Devon and Lighthouse, your loved one will be treated with care by expert addiction professionals, while family programming will give you support and healing so that you can recover as well. RCA accepts insurance, provides transportation, and offers intervention services. Call 1-888-RECOVERY now. When we ask questions, we make sure they're the big ones. Like, how can the healthcare industry earn the trust of patients? And what if your health outcomes and access to care weren't defined by your skin color, sexuality, gender, or zip code? At Genentech, we're removing barriers and partnering across the medical community to make clinical research as diverse as the world we serve to ensure communities have access to health care. Learn how we are working to make health care more equitable at gene.com slash ask bigger questions. And we're back on your radio doctor with Dr. Christine Greece. Christine, we were talking about the damage to the brain that happens when a person has a concussion. Let's talk about how we recognize an actual concussion. What are the classic symptoms and signs? Are there classic or they can be really unusual, yes? Yes, there are some that are unusual, but there's some common ones uh, that we really should be aware of. Um, The first is really a headache. So if the head was hit, the head could hurt. Uh, There could be headache. There could be pressure, um, all that uh, excessive swelling that's actually escalating in the brain uh, can cause some of these symptoms. As a result of that excessive swelling, a person can also experience some nausea, and some patients end up even vomiting, not just having nausea. Uh, You know, some of the other symptoms are really more visual and balance related. So when it comes to the vision, they could feel that their eyes are just not right. They could see floaters in their peripheral fields. They could see white flashes of light. Uh, They could see stars, kind of like what we are familiar with in cartoons. Uh, You know, they could see uh, they could just even have um, seeing shadows and just not seeing clearly. And sometimes it has nothing to do with what they're seeing, but the, what their eye movement is about. So when they move their eyes, it hurts behind the eye socket. Mm. And they'll say they have eyebrow, eyebrow pain. Um, you know, they'll have eye fatigue. So they can only see for a few minutes and then they just want to shut their eyes. Uh, and then moving on to the balance symptoms, they can experience any loss of coordination whether they're hand shaking, handwriting can be, you know, a little bit different or off. Uh, you know, they're fatiguing. They can't walk a straight line. Uh, they can't really turn very quickly without losing their balance. Uh, they feel dizziness. So dizziness is a very subjective symptom. Uh, it could be either they are, the, the room is spinning or they are spinning or both. Um, and that dizziness can also trigger a lot more nausea and then lead to vomiting. Um, there could be a lot of noise and light sensitivity, uh, Um, And then moving to the cognitive symptoms, there's a lot more of that inability to perform higher level cognitive skills and brain skills, such as thinking, processing uh, information properly, concentrating on that information as it's happening and bringing it back from attention and moving it into the memory pieces of the brain. And so they, they could be confused. They could just be feeling disoriented or they can have uh, no real cognitive problems initially after the concussion, but their cognitive endurance has changed. So they say, you know what, I am able to maintain attention, but I can't sit for a two-hour lecture like I did before. Maybe I can just last for 20 minutes and then my cognition, you know, really fails out on me. And so all of these types of uh, symptoms are, are usually experienced after the concussion. Mm-hmm. And if it's a little child under age four or five, as you say, maybe they have vomiting or maybe their sleep pattern is off, or they're cranky, or, or an older person, as you say, um, they might just have, be acutely confused and, and not complain of a headache. So mm-hmm. they're the kind of things that we have to keep Correct. in mind. And as you said, you don't have to lose consciousness to have the diagnosis of concussion. I remember when we were residents, one of the neurologists said, if you have a head trauma, if you have, you know, you hit your head or motor vehicle accident and you have a headache that lasts longer than 15 minutes, that that's the, the first uh, marker of a concussion. Is that so? Uh, that can be so. Um, it's not really an exact 15 minutes. Uh, exactly. Some patients don't experience headache at all. Uh, you know, I take care mm. of a large group of patients that actually have no headaches, but they've had other issues such as the balance, uh, the balance issues, the vision, visual issues and the cognitive issues. Um, and so it's not necessarily just one or the other, but headache is the most common complaint 
in concussion. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned something earlier about repeated um, what might be considered mild injury. Um, but if a, if a, a, especially an athlete or say somebody on a, on a job site and they're, um, they have a head injury, but the adrenaline's flowing in the middle of that ice hockey game or football or field hockey, whatever it is, and they get a tap in the head and they're like, I'm fine. Let's go. Let's, let's go here. The adrenaline's blocking any pain or symptoms and they get a second impact. That's the thing we want to drive home with parents who are saying, you know, telling their little six year olds playing, uh, soccer steamroller them no we want to take a child out or an athlete and evaluate them on the sidelines how do we go about the sideline evaluation well it's very important to remember that second impact syndrome based on the amount of swelling initially there is a lot Mm -hmm. more swelling in that subsequent injury that is almost fatal if it's not addressed immediately second impact syndrome can cause irreversible brain damage and swelling where the brain literally herniates through the small hole in the skull called the foramen magnum, and it is a medical emergency. Um, and so in order to avoid a second impact, we recognize the first impact, get the, get the child out of the game, get the athlete out of the game, um, and allow the brain to, uh, and, this, and all that swelling to reduce. Um, and so with a sideline evaluation, it's very important to uh, first check their overall appearance, are they laying down or are they able to hold their posture up? If they are laying down, the first thing is airway, breathing, circulation. Make sure they're breathing. They're, make sure that their extremities are nice and warm. Um, and it's very, very important that they are stabilized the neck. So C-spine injury is very important. Cervical spine injuries can happen. And so stabilizing the neck is the most important thing to allow them to roll back and forth or twist their head or their neck. Um, and then a general neurological exam is done visual. I usually yell out in their ears so that they can hear me. I actually tell them, where are we at the game? Where are you right now? What state are we in? What team are you playing against? Really asking a lot of detailed orientation questions that only the athlete can answer if they are oriented and if they're aware of their surroundings. Um, And so are they asking them if they're able to account for details of the accident immediately after? And so this is how we test for amnesia. Because remember, post-traumatic amnesia is one of the ways that we can uh, evaluate outcomes later on. Those who have undergone uh, any sort of amnesia have a little bit worse prognosis compared to those that didn't have amnesia and can account for all those details. And so after the, during that neurological exam, it's important to check for amnesia, to check to see, are they, are they accounting for every detail? Can they account for the hit? When before the hit, during the hit, and after the hit, can they account for all the details of what they felt? Uh, and then the command following, uh, doing a general muscular strength testing. Um, and if they are able to stand up for me, I tell them do the balance error scoring system, which is 95% to 99% sensitive and specific for a balance deficit after a concussion in an athlete. And so you can't really find any more specific tests than that. If they can't pass this balance error scoring system test, then you, we're going to get them out of the game for a while and they have to come see us in the office. Uh, because it's, it's really not safe to go back. Studies have shown that those who have failed a balance test on the field go back are more likely to have a subsequent head injury and have lingering symptoms than those who don't. Um, and so we check for that. And then we check their visual. I do a, something called a vestibular ocular motor screen. So I move their eyes in all these different directions. We do a saccade testing, peripheral field testing. And we, oh, we, I always check their convergence to see if their eye muscles are strong enough to, you know, to take care, you know, to address all of to the work uh, together. The yeah. And, and mm-hmm. I'm asking. Exactly. So, yeah. And I guess what, what makes my own heart stop, having watched my own children play grade school, high school, all college athletes, is when you see an injury or you see a, a player go down, are they going to be honest and say, I'm having, no, don't, you know, are they going to deny and risk going back in because they don't want to let the team down or it's a championship game or if they're in high school and they want to get recruited, all kinds of things go through their young minds and they're not looking into the dangers of denial. And um, that's a message we can talk about later with prevention. But I, I really love your explanation. When you do follow up, you you have two programs of, of uh, great importance. One is return to learn. Before we talk about return to play, return to learn. And for an older person, return to work. Tell us about those, if you would. 
Absolutely. Um, and so it's always important when athletes come in and even non-athletes, like I ask, I tell them, uh, and some of them that are non-athletes, they just want to return to the gym, right. And working mm-hmm. out and being mm-hmm. active. Um, but I say, I say to them, it's so important return to learn first before return to play and return to work. And so I usually lump the return to learn and return to uh, play together, uh, separate from the return to work based on the person's actual job function and, and their duties. When it comes to a return to learn or return to play, uh, we start first with gradual symptom uh, tolerance. And we've really gotten away from being completely symptom-free before we move to the next stop step. That used to be actually when I uh, when I graduated in 20, 2013 from uh, from fellowship. It was uh, always uh, you know wait until they're completely all their symptoms are resolved before moving graduating to the next phase um, of increased physical activity or learning activity or academic challenges. Now that's not the case. We do generally a lot more of. Uh, symptom decrease or um, reduction, and then they move on to the next activity of, if you could tolerate 20 minutes, increase to 40 minutes of screen time, increase to 40 minutes of learning, reading, writing, speaking, uh, and then increase to to, uh, up to two hours at a time straight in classwork, reducing homework um, as the necessary, reducing activities of more so of hearing activities as as opposed to less visual activities at school. Um, And then all of these academic duties are slightly reduced. They're taking a lot more time to do their homework, extended time to to complete tasks, examinations, uh, all types of projects. They just get a lot more time. Um, mm-hmm. And then it comes, the same goes for play. Uh, when it comes to return to play, there's a very different criteria. Uh, we do general walking 20 minutes, then walking 40 minutes, and then treadmill training up to 40 minutes symptom with symptom reduction. Um, and then after they do that, then they do non-contact drills, um, no weights at all until they could do some sort of more contact-specific, uh, sports-specific drills. Um, with some weights involved, and we increase by 25 pound increments, and then we go into full competition. If they have graduated and have not had a symptom increase in any of those other stages, and so that's really the return to learn and return to work phase. And that makes perfect. Uh, I'm sorry, return to learn and return to play. Mm-hmm. It makes perfect sense because we used to think that we would put per, uh, uh, a person, no matter what age, at complete rest. But as you say, if they are, their symptoms begin to decrease. The motion um, is probably a good way to increase blood supply to the brain. Am I right? Well, yes. In terms of, remember, the cerebral autoregulation system is impaired after a concussion. Mm -hmm. And so you want to gradually increase blood supply, but not too much. Because then it would actually cause a counterproductive effect. Okay. And so the other thing that goes through my mind is preseason physicals and we can talk about that when we return from the break stay with us and your radio doctor today's edition of your radio doctor with dr marianne ritchie presented exclusively by independence blue cross can be enjoyed anytime anywhere at your convenience just download the odyssey app and search your radio doctor it's health education on demand This is Emily Rubin, registered dietitian with Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and Thomas Jefferson University Celiac Center and the PR chair for the Academy of Philadelphia and Dietetic Association, presenting you with your tip of the week. And we are presenting our third segment on the gluten-free diet and the hidden sources of gluten. One of the number one places where patients can get hidden sources of gluten is at restaurants. So even though restaurants may feature an extensive gluten-free menu, you need to make sure that they actually prepare it gluten-free. So you would want to ask the server to make sure that they're not preparing the chicken where there could be flour or bread or pasta, or they're changing the water that they may use for gluten-free pasta versus regular pasta. Other hidden sources of gluten when dining out are French fries. Most fryers cook foods other than fries. They'll put breaded chicken fingers, mozzarella sticks, wings. Again, this would contaminate the fryer, so you need designated fryers. So if you decide you want to go to a diner and decide to have eggs for breakfast, are they cooking those eggs on the same grill as pancakes and French toast? And did you know that actually some restaurants added pancake batter to their omelets to make them fluffy? All that does is add gluten to your meal. 
pizza. So even if pizza is labeled gluten free, is it actually or prepared gluten free? Is it on the same pan as regular pizza? It can be cooked in the same oven, but you definitely want to look for a separate pan and even a separate slicer and ask. And what about a Chinese or Japanese foods or Asian foods? Soy sauce. That's the number one hidden gluten contaminant that is found in those foods. Soy sauce is made from something called wheat or hydrolyzed vegetable protein. Most restaurants use soy sauce, so you can ask for a gluten-free soy sauce or even bring your own. Another hidden source of gluten is the California Susi roll, where they make it with surmi, which is an imitation crab that also contains wheat. So next time you order sushi, make sure you order tuna or salmon or fresh fish. And then what about the movie theater popcorn? Well, again, that butter that they put on the movie theater popcorn or even the butter that it's cooked in could also contain gluten. Other sneaky sources of gluten, prescription medications and vitamin supplements. Just because your doctor prescribes you a medication that you pick up at a pharmacy, we don't know if it's necessarily gluten-free. Where is it actually coming from? What manufacturer? There's also a website called glutenfreedrugs.com. Also, when it comes to vitamins, Motrin, anything you take over the counter, you have to make sure that it's labeled gluten-free. And also, what about lipstick, lip balm, chapstick, mouthwashes, toothpaste? Again, anything that goes into your mouth will come into your intact with your intestinal tract and therefore could contain gluten. So always check with the manufacturer to make sure they're labeled gluten-free. This is Emily Rubin wrapping up the nutrition tip of the week. For more information, you could log on to yourradiodoctor.com. I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars, Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com slash star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. When you have orthopedic issues, you need a physician who eats, sleeps, and breathes orthopedics. You need an exceptionally specialized Rothman orthopedics physician. They not only specialize in orthopedics, each Rothman physician only focuses on one area of the body, which means you can have confidence that you can get past pain and be what you were. Schedule conveniently online at RothmanOrtho.com. That's RothmanOrtho.com. Are you in excruciating pain brought on by your son, daughter, or spouse suffering from addiction? You are not alone. If you call Recovery Centers of America today at 1-888-RECOVERY, your whole family can begin to recover. At Recovery Centers of America at Devon and Lighthouse, your loved one will be treated with care by expert addiction professionals, while family programming will give you support and healing so that you can recover as well. RCA accepts insurance, provides transportation, and offers intervention services. Call 1-888-RECOVERY. Now, When we ask questions, we make sure they're the big ones. Like when it comes to diseases, can we strive to treat, prevent, and even reverse them? And how can we make healthcare more effective and more affordable? These are the types of questions that can help impact the lives of so many patients, that help push the boundaries of innovation and healthcare for all communities. At Genentech, we are the pioneers of the biotech industry, tackling some of the biggest questions in healthcare. Learn more at gene.com slash ask bigger questions. Your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie, now Saturday afternoons at 5, presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. This program is paid for by Your Radio Doctor, LLC. And we're back on Your Radio Doctor with Dr. Christine Grease. Christine, you've shared so much great information about concussions in general and specifically I'd really like to talk about management in more detail. I'd like to say, though, um, with preseason uh, physicals for uh, student athletes, that's been a big help, yes? It's a shame we can't do pre-life uh, baseline physicals on everybody, like, I guess, soldiers as well. But tell us about the preseason baseline evaluation that you do. Well, uh, the Preseason uh, physicals are generally uh, more the overall uh, health, the vital signs of the athlete, the health, the strength, the stamina of the athlete. Uh, generally, we do uh, muscular strength testing. Um, I always do a vestibular ocular motor screen. I want to make sure that they don't have any uh, issues with saccades movement because remember, <laughs> tracking and visually able to track back and forth without any fatigue of the eyes. Uh, you know, one of the telltale symptoms that an athlete has lied on a prior test 
Um, and they may have sustained a concussion. They just didn't know. Um, I maybe I shouldn't say lying, but maybe I should say that they just were, you know, they weren't even aware or they, maybe they were aware and they just weren't telling the truth. And so doing that first screen is, is my way of kind of screening and phasing out who is more susceptible to having a, a, a subsequent concussion and who isn't. Um, and then the other mm -hmm. test I always like to do is the convergence testing to check that eye muscle strength. Uh, you know, to see if they're able to have, the, um, you know, that fine tuning uh, when it comes to peripheral or, or far distance and uh, near uh, sightedness. When it also comes to a balance test, I do the balance error scoring system in the office um, just to make sure that they have zero errors. They're less prone to sustaining another concussion because the coordination is better. And uh, generally, yeah. a mini mental status test and an overall cognitive evaluation is also done. Um, and so after mm -hmm. that, they do an impact test. We get their impact number on baseline so that we can compare it. If, God forbid, they do get a concussion or sustain one during the season, we can compare it to the original. Um, and that's generally mm -hmm. the main thing, uh, you know, kind of preseason. And that makes such great sense because the other thing is, I, you know, there are what we call uh, collision sports that people expect more. But guess what? I'm, I'm telling you, you're the star here. Baseball, tennis, any physical activity can lead to a concussion, not just the ones that, uh, you know, football and ice hockey, et cetera. So it's so critical to diagnose them properly and have an effective treatment plan. Tell us how you would go, go about management uh, after a concussion. So it's very important. I always advise patients relative rest initially. Sleep is truly the best medicine. Uh, the brain has gone into a fight or flight mode, and as a result, it will stay in that alert position. Why? Because the brain manages all the systems of the body, so everything else will be affected if they don't get proper sleep. So I advise them how to rest. We go over sleep hygiene. We go over taking only melatonin and avoiding all other sleep medications over the counter, including Benadryl, which is a common myth. They say, take the Benadryl off the concussion. It's great. It's not. It is dangerous. It's not safe. It actually has been relative contraindicated in the severe brain injury population. So we don't recommend it. We only recommend really melatonin to help with sleep at night temporarily until they kind of get that cycle. So we go over sleep as the first thing. Managing, I also go, put them on a specific vitamin cocktail, usually three or four very great vitamins. Any concussion program in the country always recommends it, not just myself. And we go over that they must take these supplements twice a day for the remainder of the season or for three months if it's, they're not an athlete. And then we go over headache management. Then we discuss headache triggers, reduction of noise, and how to uh, get, keep a journal properly of their headaches and so that we can address those, uh, you know, well the next visit. Uh, and then we initiate neck exercises. Remember, the muscles of the neck, if they are strong, if an athlete focuses on improving their neck flexibility, even tightrope walkers and cheerleaders, if their neck is, muscles are either weak or tight, they are more prone to injury and they will not maintain their balance. Why? Because we have balance sensors all across the upper part of our neck anyway. And so if they're not stretched and strengthened properly, then they're more prone to injury. So we go over that and then from a visual complaint, I always tell my patients, buy a set of, don't go for the sunglasses if the lights are really bothering you. Try to expose yourself to daily sunlight, 20 minutes at least or 30 minutes a day. Sunlight improves and increases serotonin levels in the brain. Not really from a vitamin D perspective, uh, you know, because I'm not an endocrinologist, <laughs> but mainly for the serotonin levels. Why? Because serotonin is depleted after the injury. We know that. Dopamine is also depleted. We've seen it in CSS studies. We've seen it in lumbar punctures. So we know that that is a phenomenon. Um, and we, oh, I always tell them, I say, expose yourself to the sunlight. Back in the medieval times, when we have not had concussion specialists to kind of talk about uh, concussions and these soldiers were, you know, in the battlefield after, you know, falling off their horses, they would be placed for about up to two hours in the marketplaces. That was a general uh, trend in concussion management. And so we already aware that sunlight improves the, the, the overall recovery. And it will also desensitize the eyes. Uh, you know, when it comes to even balance, I always tell them, I say, focus on just core exercises. You want to do some planks, that's not a problem. You want to rest. Why? Because we need to regain that balance. Um, and when it comes to the cognition and we tell them to manage their symptoms, I say, let's get an, a cognitive evaluation. If they didn't do well, I'll tell them, wait on a neuropsychological exam. That's usually later down the line if they didn't do very well subsequent visits. 
Um, and then I always tell them, I say, you're going to take your break. I make them aware. I tell these eight students, remember, there are some athletes who are on scholarships. They need to maintain their grades in order to continue playing. And in order to mm-hmm. do that, they are they usually stressed out when they, they feel like, why am I all of a sudden failing when I used to be a straight A student? And the reality is their brain is tired. And so by making them aware of that is usually the first step in managing it. And I tell them, hey, listen, you're going to I want you to read for up to 20, 30 minutes. No, even if you feel great, stop reading, go take a break. Don't, don't take a break on your phone. You stay away, go out in nature, go outside, close your eyes. If you have to keep your eyes open, uh, expose yourself to the sunlight, come back inside and then resume the reading. You can get a lot more done and you will not do it with any error. And they're re- going to reduce the chances of, um, you know, making mistakes or getting things wrong. And then, of course, overall uh, advising them, saying, hey, by the way, because of all this going on, you will be a little bit irritable. Concussion patients are known to be a little bit more temperamental, irritable. And they just like, why am I acting? this way this is not myself and their family members may sometimes say you know what this is not how my loved one used to behave and what's going on why are they short fuse and making them aware that their brain is tired and so they will not be able to tolerate the same things that they were before and it just takes time for over overall for them to recover um, and, and so mean, we do have therapies for all of these things it's my first set of recommendations that it helps well, you make such important points and everything you discuss seems so, um, just pure common sense, but I think education, uh, we talked about that a little bit, educating, um, parents, educating athletes, educating the caregivers. Uh, I don't think as many people, at least in my experience, have the depth of knowledge that you do. So let's talk about a few tips uh, for prevention. You know, I think about cartoons with the roadrunner and every time he gets bonked on the head the little kids laugh i mean i think for the longest time cartoons or um um even video games uh that people think you get hit in the head you bounce back or okay you know let's celebrate the more knockouts you get as a boxer the better no tell us what the most important tips for prevention are well most importantly for prevention is allowing uh well, for if you, if there was a concussion initially, allow enough time to recover from the first one. Um, if there wasn't a concussion in in, a, in an athlete's history, and you know, and we're trying to avoid it moving forward, uh, then I always tell patients: first thing is work on your rest, work on your ability to settle down at night and develop those good sleep hygiene techniques because the better we sleep, the more alert and awake and aware our brains will be in the daytime. And so that's the first thing. Second thing I always tell them is strengthen your core, strengthen your neck muscles so that even if God forbid, there was a close to a blow in the head, the more muscles we have in our body, especially in that neck, guess what? They're going to act like shock absorbers Mm -hmm. because we're not like little children who have bouncy heads because of all that cartilage and, you know, our fontanelles are not fused. Like we're adult and adults. It's very, it's very different. Anyone over the age of five, it's very different. Um, And so I always tell them with prevention, work on those uh, neck muscles, work on core exercises, work on general conditioning, being able to have that heart rate go up nicely to a very almost submaximal threshold and then a maximum threshold of heart rate. Cardiovascular training has been proven over and over and over again, two to three times a week has been proven to reduce the the effects of a concussion if there was one, or to reduce one from happening in the first place because of their awareness. It speeds your reflexes. They're able to avoid that ball coming at them a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. Their senses are on alert. Um, and avoiding alcohol, obviously, before games, avoiding alcohol, but you know, before any time, it's, it's important so that we can have that brain function at the maximum capacity. Um, and so, when it comes to all of these other types of prevention, then there is gear. You know, we always talk a lot in, in the sports world about gear, about different helmets, about different you know ways. Overall, yes, there are great helmets out there, but there, till this day, there have not been one helmet that has been proven to uh, prevent a concussion. That was my question. Prevention of concussion mm -hmm. is technique. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, is there any new technology? But it's teaching young people and (laughs) of all ages how to play safely. And if you pick up a new sport on your own socially, like tennis or something, you have to learn how to play safely. um, Because, and lastly, well, I'll ask you this in the next segment. We're going to take a little break. 
how can you predict which patients might have long-term residual symptoms? Let's take a little break and we'll be back for our wrap up with Dr. Christine Grease. Your Radio Doctor with Dr. Marianne Ritchie is presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. Hi, I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars. That's Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some of these Medicare Advantage plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. And all plans include dental, vision, and hearing benefits with no co-pays for routine exams. Medicare's highest rating, Philly's most popular plan. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract renewal. This is a paid endorsement. When you have joint pain, you need a physician who eats, sleeps, and breathes joints. Someone so focused on their specialty, they've written the book on it, literally. You need an exceptionally specialized physician from Rothman Orthopedics. They not only specialize in orthopedics, each Rothman physician only focuses on one area of the body, which means you can have confidence that you can get past the pain and be what you were. Schedule conveniently online at RothmanOrtho.com. Official orthopedic partner of the Eagles, Phillies, and Sixers. Now, your weekly prescription brought to you by Genentech, the science-driven company that pioneered the biotech industry to transform how we treat the world's most complex health problems. And welcome back to our final segment of Your Radio Doctor with our guest, Dr. Christine Grease. This is our weekly segment called Your Weekly Prescription, a wrap-up of the show brought to you by Genentech, the first biotech company in the U.S. Christine, we've talked about management, recognizing um, concussions and prevention. At what point do you look at a patient, be it a student athlete, a professional athlete, or a person in a work setting and say, we have to make a big change. Your athletic career is over or you need a different position at work. It's, it's a tough, really, um, moment for the patient to face. And it's a hard message for you to deliver. How do you determine that? Well, um, yes, it is. It's very difficult, um, especially if there's a lot at stake uh, with the athlete or that's the pa- their passion. Um, and the most important thing is, uh, in terms of long term, you know, we we look at their residual symptoms. We look at uh, things that have been lingering. Their inability to function in day to day life when it comes to physical functioning, cognitive functioning, um, emotional functioning. Uh, you know, I kind of break it down in those three different realms. And we look to see if the athlete is, uh, their function, their function is breaking down in their day to day life and their personal life and their quality of life is impaired. Then we start saying, okay, you know what? This is not safe. This is, this is not good. It's like heading in the wrong direction. We may have to pull the patient out, um, whether it be pulling them out of the game or pulling them out of their career or changing job, job descriptions. Um, so we've had a lot of different patients who, because they've had these long-term residual symptoms from a concussion, um, it's it's one of those things that have been um, unfortunate, but it's very it's very necessary. And so, with people, those athletes who have had ongoing lingering symptoms on the time off when they're not competing, uh, and they have these lingering symptoms that just don't get better, and then they go back into the game, then we start talking about changing uh, sports. Uh, or, or pulling them out of the game completely and, 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 their, and ending their career um, when it comes to them being affected in their, in their day-to-day living because of these symptoms. And when we've tried and really used all our resources, the non-pharmacologic and the pharmacological resources, uh, and we've exhausted all of those resources, then we start saying, all right, you know what? We have to change it up. And this includes also those who are at work. We pull them out or we have them change their complete job description when it comes to them being unable to perform their tasks even when getting the proper accommodation. Uh, and that could be either they're making uh, errors at work, they're unable to complete their tasks even if they're not making errors, and they just cannot handle the workload because of the cognitive load. And so that's when I have that difficult conversation and tell them that we need to kind of, uh, you know, pull back. 
Well, I think we could do an entire show on myths that need to be dispelled. One of them might be if a patient is taken to the emergency room and they have a CAT scan, a CAT scan is meant to look for a bleed or a tumor or some uh, something else in the, the possibilities. But a clear CAT scan does not mean you're not at serious risk. And do you uh, predict in certain patients that they'll have long-term symptoms based on the initial injury and or their management afterwards? Because that's another drive-home message. If you've had a concussion, please get professional help to know how to get back into rhythm, back into schoolwork, work, life. Don't do it the wrong way. Couldn't that cause damage long-term? Absolutely. Uh, we know CAT scans, even MRIs, do not have the resolution that is capable of looking at axonal injury. We know that the damage of concussion is on the axon level. It's on the chemical level. We have not had that, but we can put the brain to the test through a neuropsychological examination. It's a gruesome, glorified IQ, eight-hour type of test of a cognitive mm. test where it's really putting the brain in test drive. Um, and so that's one of those tests that we like to look at to see, can we prognosticate if they will have long-term effects? Um, and that's really one of the best ways to, to evaluate for concussion. So, Christine, education is so important for parents, for students, for, I don't mean to keep stressing uh, athletics, but, you know, you see boys padded and helmeted for lacrosse and, and girls, you know, finally advance from little goggles to a, a little because they have softer sticks and it's semi-contact. No, anyone can get hurt anywhere. It's so important to educate and know to get off the field. Don't be an, uh, a hero. Admit when you're hurt because it could affect you for the rest of your life. And everybody involved needs to learn that. Is there a website where you can suggest that our listeners visit to learn more about concussions, prevention, and education? Absolutely. Uh, the Center for Disease Control really has amazing, um, you know, amazing website and knowledge. And there's lots of links on there um, that really help kind of understand concussion and some of the management that uh, is involved. Well, thank you for joining us today, Christine. We've, you've presented a wealth of information, and it's easy to see why so many people seek you out for help. Thank you so much once again. Oh, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great opportunity. Now, your real champion, presented by the Rothman Orthopedic Institute. And now for your real champion. I call this segment, Keeping Her Eye on the Goal. Just last week, we highlighted your real champion, Mr. Leo Carlin, president of the John Bon Jovi Soul Foundation, and noted that his own father, Leo Carlin, served as his son's role model and source of inspiration. This week, you'll meet a member from the third generation of Carlins. Margot Carlin is a 20-year-old student entering senior year at Boston College. She's an accomplished athlete who's played sports since childhood. As a little girl, she played soccer, then added lacrosse and field hockey. By high school, she focused on field hockey throughout the year. As a high school junior, Margot joined the lacrosse team for the spring season. It's wise to cross-train and spend time strengthening muscles in a different sport. Though the game came naturally, Margot met with great disappointment when she tore her anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL, in her knee. Her season ended with surgery and three long months of physical rehabilitation. It was a pause that would prove to be a defining moment. She had time to tap her grit and determination and all of her senior year to recover. She had to be fit for preseason as an eagle on the Boston College team where she had already been accepted. Life as a college athlete is very demanding, as much as 30 hours a week with practice, games, travel, while juggling a major in applied psychology and human development. Margaret was one of a small group selected to play in the U-17, that's under-17, national team, and has traveled the world with the U-21 team, including a chance to participate in the World Cup in Africa. In June 2021, the NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, adopted a uniform interim policy allowing college athletes to earn money from their NIL, name, image, and likeness, through endorsements. Margo is sponsored by a prominent company whose field hockey sticks are a well-known brand. Maybe it was the thrill of reaching national status in high school, followed by the threat of losing it all to injury that reminded Margo of her good fortune. But it only takes a few minutes of conversation to learn that she is as humble as she is hardworking. 
As a college freshman, she was a team leader, earning multiple accolades, including Freshman of the Year in her conference and National Field Hockey Coaches Association All-American. Through the years of her field hockey career, she didn't always have the chance to join her parents and siblings who spend so much time working with those who experience homelessness. So last year, she began her own social media campaign to raise money for Covenant House. Established in 1972, it provides 24-7 crisis care for young people up to age 21 in 33 cities and six countries. Kids who face homelessness because they've been subjects of abuse, child trafficking, and other hardships. When visiting Covenant House, Margot has been overwhelmed by stories of people her age and younger who tell her that Covenant House has saved their lives. She's equally moved by the hope in their voices and the excitement about the future now that they know they have a chance. Her campaign was highlighted by the Philadelphia Inquirer, which has brought donations from around the world. Margot is grateful for her own opportunities as an elite athlete, but takes none of it for granted. She wants to help other young people who struggle just to have the basics in life, especially with the additional stress of COVID. To date, she has parlayed her name, image, and likeness to raise over $35,000 for Covenant House. Like her grandfather and father, Margot is living the Jesuit motto to be a man or woman for others. Her parents and grandparents are stellar role models. Margot finds joy not just in putting more goals on the scoreboard, but making it her personal goal to remember those in need. We salute you, Margot Carlin, your real champion. Join Margot Carlin in helping Covenant House save the lives of young people without shelter. Visit her Twitter page at underscore Margot Carlin and see the link to donate. That's at underscore Margot. Margo, M-A-R-G-O, Carlin, C-A-R-L-I-N. Thank you for listening to our show this evening and every Saturday at 5 o'clock here on 1210 WPHT. Listen to any of our shows again on yourradiodoctor.com. Send us a story of a champion in your world and let us know if there's a topic you'd like to hear about. Send us an email to info at yourradiodoctor.net. We thank our exclusive sponsor, Independence Blue Cross, and our naming sponsors, Recovery Centers of America, Rothman Orthopedic Institute, and our newest sponsor, Genentech, the first biotech company in the U.S. If you'd like to partner in the show, send an email to info at yourradiodoctor.net. Friends, June 14, World Blood Donor Day. Think about donating during this critical time of national shortage of blood. Visit redcross.org. That's redcross.org. June 14 is also Flag Day. Please show your gratitude for those who gave of the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. Hang the stars and stripes. United we stand. Join us next week with our guest, the world famous Dr. Robert Rosenwasser, professor of neurosurgery, who'll talk about the latest therapies for strokes. This is your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie, wishing you a happy, healthy, safe week with the ones you love and always here to remind you that your health is your wealth. Thanks for listening to your radio doctor, Dr. Marianne Ritchie, presented exclusively by Independence Blue Cross. To contact Dr. Marianne and to listen to today's show as well as past shows, visit yourradiodoctor.com. This program is paid for by Your Radio Doctor, LLC. All opinions or statements expressed on this program are solely those of Your Radio Doctor and their guests and do not reflect the opinions of WPHT or Odyssey. Today's program has been pre-recorded. Hi, I'm Lisa Thomas-Laurie. If you're on Medicare, I've got great news. Keystone 65 HMO plans from Independence Blue Cross have earned five stars. That's Medicare's highest rating for 2022. Some of these Medicare Advantage plans have no monthly premiums, no deductibles, and no co-pays for primary care visits and some prescription drugs. And all plans include dental, vision, and hearing benefits with no co-pays for routine exams. Medicare's highest rating, Philly's most popular plan. Don't wait. Visit ibxmedicare.com star. Every year, Medicare evaluates plans based on a five-star rating system. Keystone 65 offers HMO plans with a Medicare contract. Enrollment in Keystone 65 Medicare Advantage plans depends on contract